Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the new Yankee Workshop. Bathroom vanities, surely a modern necessity. But why do most of them have to be so ugly? This one isn't, perhaps because its design draws on the old dry sinks of the past. And we happen to find one at the Fruitlands Museum in Harvard, Massachusetts. And that's our project today, next on the new Yankee Workshop. One thing that's nice about living in New England is that you're never far away from an old historic house like this one, a Shaker house that dates to 1790. And inside there's a nice piece I want to show you. Come on. Right here in this recreated Shaker kitchen, next to the old wood stove, was a piece of simple furniture the Shakers would have used every day, the dry sink. When not in use, the top would remain closed to make it look tidy. But to use it, they just opened it up, took a bucket filled with water, put it up on this upper level, and washed the dishes. Any spillage would fall down into this lower level and go out through a little drain, I suppose to a bucket below. It has some really nice details. The top section has dovetailed corners. There's a band that separates the top from the bottom where we find two flat panel doors. And at the very bottom, a nice little base detail. You know, when I look at a piece like this, I can make a connection between the modern bathroom vanity of today and this old dry sink. Can you? Now, before we get started, I'd like to reassure you that if you'd like to build an exact copy of today's project, a measured drawing is available. And you'll hear more about that before this program ends. Now I'd like to show you how I built this bathroom vanity. Now for this cabinet, I've chosen to do all the joinery at the corners with dovetail joints. And they're not only functional in strength, but they look good when they're finished, especially on this white oak. Now the doors are a flat panel on the outside, but on the inside you'll find a raised panel. And this is something we see a lot in shaker pieces. And the reason for it is, is that they wanted the full thickness of the wood for strength. So they had to taper the panels to make them fit in the door frame. And I think that's where I want to get started today, making the doors. And over here on my saw, I have the, the styles and the rails for each door. And the first thing I'm going to do is put a groove down the center of each of these pieces into which our panel will fit. And I'll make that on the table saw with my adjustable dado head cutter. And it's set up so that the groove will be in the center of each piece and about 3 eighths of an inch deep. OK, the next thing that I have to do is cut a mortise in all the styles. And it goes all the way through. And that's so that we can join the rails, which have tenons, through like this. Now the mortise is cut with this attachment I have on my drill press. And what it is, is a drill bit, which drills the initial hole, and then a square chisel, which squares it up. And that's all mounted in this special device right here. And then down in the bottom, there is a, another attachment which holds the wood in place. Because as you go to pull the chisel out, the wood wants to lift up, and that'll hold it down. Also, I've added a piece of wood down below here, and that's because it's a through mortise, and as the chisel comes through the other side, I don't want it to chip out big chunks of wood. Well, that makes a pretty nice joint. With a little bit of glue, that's going to stay together for years. Now I guess it's time to tell you how to make this tenon. This is what's called a haunched tenon. And it's haunched because this little piece has been left on. And that's there because it, it's needed to fill a gap when the frame is put together right here. There's a little gap left by the groove for the panel. Now the first thing I want to do to make the tenon is remove equal amounts of material, top and bottom, to get the right thickness. And I've set up the table saw, again with the adjustable dado head cutter. And I've put this guide block here. And that's just a reference to make sure I get this shoulder cut in the right place. And it also gives me some clearance when I come by here so that I don't get any bind up or kickback. Well, the 
final adjustment to the height of the blade, and now I'm ready to make that cut for this little haunch. Okay, here's my door frames loosely fitted together. And the next thing I want to do is make the panels. And I'll use this piece right here, which is two oak boards that have been glued up, and I've smoothed out the surface. And I want to take a measurement so that I can rip it to the right width. Now the opening here is 10 and 7 eighths, but I want to make the blank 3 quarters of an inch bigger so that it'll fit in these grooves. So I'm looking for a piece about 11 and 5 eighths inches. And I'll rip that right here on the table saw. All right, the next thing I want to do is cross cut my panels to length. And I suppose I could use the standard T-square that comes with the saw, but the problem is that the larger the board and the heavier it is, the more the chance of wandering like this and not getting perfectly square cuts. So I'm going to use my old homemade panel cutter. Let me show you how it works. It's just a big version of the T-square, and it has a hardwood piece on the bottom which fits in the standard groove of the saw, and then there's a piece of plywood with a fence on it, and it's at perfect 90 degree angle to the saw blade, so I know I'm going to get square cuts every time. And with my tape hooked on that freshly squared end, I know the length of my panel is to be 14 and 13 sixteenths. Let's take another look at our dry sink. You see the detail on the inside of the door again. It's a raised panel. And to cut that, I'm going to use my radial arm saw in which a molding head cutter has been mounted in place of the regular saw blade. And it's just a heavy wheel with three cutters which, spinning around, will remove material. Now, I'm going to do the raised panel in two passes, especially with this hard oak. It's too much material to take out at once. So we'll make one pass adjusted and do the second. Always doing the end grain first to minimize splintering. One thing about these mortise and tenon joints is that there's a lot of surfaces to put the glue on, which means I should get a real tight joint. It'll last for a long, long time. Now we'll just slip this in like that. Now I'll just slide the panel in, and I don't use any glue on the panel because I want that to float freely in these dados so that they can it can expand and contract with changes in humidity. Now one has to remember that when you clamp things up like this, don't put too much pressure on there, just enough to squeeze it together. A little bit of glue will come out of the joint. That's all we need. All right, now over here, I've got some boards that I glued up to make the sides of our dry sink. And I want to point out that I always pay close attention to the growth rings, and I'll wet this a little here. And you can see that over on this piece, the rings curve in this direction, which means the bark was out here. And on this piece, they curve in this direction, which means the bark was out here. And by alternating the direction of the growth rings, you end up with a much more stable piece of glued up wood. And the first thing I want to do to this piece is scrape off the excess glue that squeezed out and to do that, I'm just going to use an ordinary paint scraper. The width of this side panel wants to be 18 and a quarter, and the height wants to be 32 and a half. And I'll rip it first at 18 and a quarter, which I've already set on the table saw. Now I'll just cross cut the sides to the right height. And boy, this panel cutter really comes in handy with pieces this size. Right. 
Next thing I want to do to these side panels is put a rabbet right in the top edge here. And that's so that this top frame can sit in it, and this will hold the countertop down. Also, I want to put a rabbet along the back edge to recess the plywood backing. I've got the table saw all set up with the dado head, and I'll make that top rabbet first. Now this top frame is made from two inch pine. The long pieces being grooved the entire length. And then these short pieces have little tongues which fit into that groove. Let's make the grooves first. That's good. Now these joints just get held together with a little bit of glue and some brads just to hold it in place until the glue sets up. Well now let's take a look underneath our dry sink. And you'll see that the bottom and the sides are attached to this pine frame. And there's really not much fancy about this. Just a little bit of glue and ordinary butt joints fastened together with a few screws. OK, now we're ready for a little assembly of our dry sink. This is the top frame, which gets fastened to the side by driving some screws through the top. Now, in all these connections, I like to apply a little bit of glue because it never, it never hurts to add a little extra strength to the joint. And now this is the base we just assembled, and that also gets fastened with a few drywall screws. And now for the bottom shelf, a little glue. It's just a piece of 5 8 plywood. Drop down in place, holding it flush with the front of the side panel. And I'll just secure that with some finish nails, six penny finish nails, So I don't want to really see the screw heads in here. Well, now I want to install this little cleat along the back edge of the top frame. And ultimately, that'll be used to fasten the dry sink to a wall. See, the back of the dry sink is nothing more than a piece of quarter inch Luan plywood. And it's fastened at the top and the bottom with some five penny nails into the pine. And on the sides, where it would be real difficult to drive nails in the oak, I'm using screws, being sure to pre-drill some holes. Well, now I need to build this projection of our dry sink and make the dovetail joints. And to do that, I start out by making a couple little pieces here, which will fit on the sides. And they've been rabbited out to fit over the top frame. And I've taken the left-hand one and the front piece and set it up in my dovetailing jig. And following the instructions with the jig, I'll cut the dovetails in the two pieces. Okay. Now you'll notice that when I made the front piece here, I didn't dovetail all the way to the top of it. And that's so that when it's assembled, I didn't want this rabbit, rabbited joint to show through. That fits good. Now a little bit of glue on these dovetails, and I'll be ready to attach it to the 
dry sink frame. Now I'm going to pre-drill a few holes for some nails along the top edge. Apply a little bit of glue. Okay, we'll put a little clamp pressure on that, hold it together, let it set overnight, and we'll get back to work on this dry sink tomorrow morning. I'm going to get started this morning making the face frame. The face frame is made from four pieces of wood joined at the corners by half lap joints. The best way to cut them is on a radial arm saw. Now these half lap joints are assembled just by putting some glue on all the surfaces, sliding them together and then just using a couple 5 8 inch screws will secure it in place while the glue sets up. Okay, some glue applied to the edges of the side panels and a little bit to that bottom piece of plywood. And you just set the face frame in the glue. And I found that working with any hardwood, especially this oak, you want to pre-drill for any nails or screws. Oh boy, that's as smooth as a baby's bottom. Now let's see, I guess the next thing I want to do is work on this base right here. So let's take a look back at the prototype. And you'll see it's just one by four oak that goes around the corners with dovetail joinery. Okay, let's see how those fit. Pretty good. Now we're ready to do the other end. Okay, I just pre-drill some holes through the oak and secure the base in place with some small finish nails. Next, I want to put a little edge on this base. And to do that, I'm going to use my router with a chamfering bit. It's just a bit at a 45 degree angle. And this little roller bearing here is just a guide so it won't mar the work. Well, now I'm ready to get started hanging the doors. Let's go back and look at our prototype. The doors are hung in place with these little hinges right here. And the one that's on the style is mortised. In other words, I ch took a knife and a chisel and carved out the wood so it would sit flush. And the one on the door is surface mounted. Now, the reason I didn't mortise the one on the door was because if I had, this gap might have been too small. And I would stand the chance of the door becoming hinge bound. Now to chisel these in or set them in, what I like to do is screw the hinge right to the style in the location that it's going to be. That way it's, it's easier to hold. It holds itself in place. Then I'll take a sharp utility knife and trace the outline of the hinge. And then I'll take it out. And then just using a chisel, I'll remove the right amount of material. Boy, is this oak hard. It takes a good, sharp chisel. OK, that fits pretty good. Three more to go. Well, even though this hinge is just surface mounted to the door, I don't think I'll have any problems because it's light enough. The hinge is nice though because it allows the door to open 180 degrees and now what we ought to do is just check the fit between the two doors and I think that looks pretty good and now we're ready to start working on the top now the top for our dry sink cabinet is made from high pressure laminate which is bonded to a piece of particle board 
fact, this is high density particle board, especially made for countertops. Now, because I don't want just three quarters of an inch of thickness around the edge, I want this to be about an inch and a half, the first thing I'm going to have to do is build up the thickness of this particle board. And to do that, I'm just going to use some one by two pine applied around the edges with some glue and screws. OK, that takes care of building up the edge. Now the next thing I want to do is make this oak band that'll go around the edge. And that also has a dovetail joint at the corners. OK. Yeah, the perfect dovetail every time. Now let's try this out on the blank. Oh, good, that fits together good. Now I'll just glue up the joints and attach it to the top. Well, now I'm ready to apply some contact cement in a well-vented area to the laminate and to the particle board. Now, you can put it on with a brush or a roller, but I like to use just a scrap piece of laminate. And it's better to put on two thin coats than one thick coat. It should look about like this as you put it on. OK, that takes care of the first coat. It'll take about 10 minutes for this to dry, and then I'll come back and put the second coat on. All right, well, that second coat is dry. The contact cement will just be tacky to the touch. And now for these sticks, which are really the most important part of the job. These I lay down on top of the particle board, and that allows me to adjust the laminate before I make a commitment to sticking it down. Because there's one thing with contact cement, and that's that when the two surfaces touch one another, there's no moving them. And you don't want to end up with the top a little bit off of one edge, not covering the particle board. So I just set it in place and make sure it's hanging over all four edges. And I can just pull these strips out. Okay. Letting it go down in the middle first. I'm going to pull the two edge ones out. And now I'm just going to take a little roller and start in the middle and roll out to the edges making sure that I have a good bond and I roll out any air bubbles that might be under there. Well, now I'm ready to trim off the excess laminate around the edges. And to do that, I use my router with the laminate trimming bit. And that's just a cutter with a couple carbide edges and a little ball bearing which guides it along so that it cuts just the laminate and not the wood along the edge. Well, the next thing I want to do is chamfer the edge of the top. And I'll do that using my router with a chamfering bit. And what that does is allows a little more oak to show through the edge. And I just think it's a really nice detail. Well, the next thing I want to do is make this oak backsplash. So I've got a piece clamped down in the vise here. It's about four inches wide. And I'm going to chamfer three edges. Okay, I've just drilled three holes along the back edge of the counter, and they're for these screws, which I'll put in from underneath, and they will secure the backsplash in place, like that. Okay, well now, before I put the knobs on the doors or put a sink in this top, let's finish it. Boy, don't those dovetail joints look great? For my money, this white oak is best finished clear. So I'm starting out with a sanding sealer. And when this is dry, I'll sand it down and put a final coat of satin polyurethane. With the sealer dry, I've sanded the entire case with some 320 grit 
wet, dry sandpaper. And you can see there's a little powdery substance, like a talcum, that's left over. So I vacuum the entire vanity, and now I'll just wipe it down with a rag dampened with mineral spirits. Now this is the part of the project I really like the most, putting on the finished coats. I'm using a satin finish polyurethane, and this is where that dust-free environment is critical. Dust getting on this before it's dry is going to ruin all my work. I'll put on three coats, lightly rubbing between coats with steel wool, and that should give me a really durable finish. With the first coat of polyurethane dry, I did a very light sanding and then found an appropriately colored putty to fill the nail holes, and now I'm putting the final coat of polyurethane on. Imagine the satisfaction of being able to build a piece of furniture like this in your own home workshop and then being able to look at it and use it every day. Our next project is this cherry trestle table, modeled after one we found on the island of Nantucket. Hope to see you back here next time on the new Yankee Workshop.